wonderful introduction and thank you everybody uh, for spending your time with me for the next hour or so. So today we'll be talking about FX derivatives. Uh, the title of the paper is Are Intermediary Constraints Priced? Uh, this is joint work with Amy, who is also online, and also Ben A. Bear at Stanford. Okay, so um, to give you first a one slight introduction, um, we know that intermediaries uh, face regulatory and some other self-imposed risk management constraints. So intermediaries, thinking about a canonical example, like a big global bank. Um, what are the constraints I'm talking about? More specifically, a very famous and important one is the Basel III leverage ratio requirement, which requires big banks to maintain 3% um, equity against all assets, regardless of their risk um, characteristics. Okay, so we see that these constraints prevent intermediaries or global banks from closing arbitrage opportunities. Why? Because by putting uh, arbitrage positions on intermediate balance sheet, even if the trade is riskless, it still expands the size of the balance sheet and make regulation like the leverage ratio requirement more binding. Um, so as a result, uh, we think post-crisis in particular, we have many no arbitrage violations. Um, a good textbook example is we started having covered interest rate parity violation, which is going to be the central object for today's seminar. So that's the background. Um, so in this paper, we ask a very specific research question. That's the third bullet. Is the risk that these constraints tighten a priced risk factor? Okay. So we implement, we can construct a direct test in the sense we ask, does betting on these arbitrage violation shrinking earn a risk premium? The idea, core idea behind this empirical exercise is we're going to construct a tradable uh, trading strategy um, whose payoff is linear in the size of future arbitrage violation. And the intuition behind this exercise is to think about the magnitude of this no arbitrage violation uh, can be interpreted as the bindingness of futures uh, balance sheet constraint. And if we construct a betting strategy uh, whose payoff, for instance, is good, if the bindingness of future constraint is not high, so future constraint is not as binding, um, it, it earns positive profits, whereas, um, or, or uh, in the other side of the world, maybe the future constraint is more binding uh, the arbitrage uh, the, the trading strategy earns negative profits um, so we want to check whether such uh, a trading strategy earns a risk premium on average uh, so that's in the sense our answer direct answer to whether such risk that constraints tighten is a price risk factor um, our short answer is yes there seems to be a significant risk premium in the data post crisis and furthermore, that this risk factor is correlated with many other near arbitrages, so we don't have to restrict ourselves to CIP violations. And also, it's correlated with some other more, uh, more well-known uh, measures of intermediate wealth, but not perfectly correlated. So we're indeed adding additional information uh, in understanding the constraints of intermediaries. And finally, I'm also going to generalize it to the cross-section to show you some evidence that exposure to this risk factor, the CIP constructed risk factor, is consistently priced in the cross-section of many assets, so beyond FX. So that's our goal today. Um, let's move on. Okay, so, um, so talk today, since I'm for doing it, so it's gonna be largely empirical. So we have one slide of motivation to tell you that we do have a model in the paper. Um, it's a standard uh, intermediary-based asset pricing model built upon he and Christian Murthy. Uh, additional twist is we adding additional intertemporal consideration, uh, a la Campbell 93. Um, so the feature of the model is we have intermediaries uh, face a regulatory constraint, for instance, a leverage constraint, uh, which creates CIP violations. Uh, so what does these violations reveal? Uh, they reveal uh, the shadow cost or the Lagrange multiplier on this balance sheet constraint. Um, in other words, they also represent investment opportunity, right? Because arbitrage, they are like pure investment opportunities, uh, which makes the intertemporal hedging consideration relevant and important. 
Okay, so the goal of this model is really to motivate uh, the following version of log linearized SDF. Uh, so it has two factors. The first factor is the well-known one uh, from the, inter the traditional intermediate-based asset pricing model. That's the RW, uh, so that's the return on intermediate wells. The new ingredient that we're adding in this paper is we have additional factor, uh, so the absolute value of X. What is X? X stands for the cross-currency basis, which is the jargon uh, that we use uh, to measure uh, CIP violation. Um, it has multiple subscripts because um, this paper is going to be using the term structure information of CIP violation. So let me introduce this uh, sub subscripts first. Um, so the first subscript, uh, just T plus one, this denotes the, the trading time. Um, so think about this is next period CIP deviation. What type of CIP deviation? Um, if you see zero in the second subscript, um, this denotes the, the forward starting time. So if it's zero, it's a spot. It's a spot rate, okay? So this means it's a spot CIP deviation next period, okay? And the third subscript denotes the maturity of the CIP deviation. So say we're talking about the one month CIP deviation one month away from today. So that's the factor that we're adding into this intermediaries SDF. And the hypothesis is um, this C or the loading on this new factor is meaningfully different from zero. And our empirical test is going to be constructing a trading strategy whose payoff is linear in this um, next period uh, spot CIP deviation. All right, if that's clear, um, let me um, say a few more words and then I can pause for some clarifying questions. Um, so the model's implications are several folds. For instance, um, we're not gonna be uh, talking much about why uh, the arbitrageurs are doing Australian dollar versus the Japanese dollar uh, basis uh, instead of the, the Euro dollar basis. Uh, in this paper, the model is very simple. It's basically gonna ask the arbitrageurs to focus on the largest CIP deviations. Uh, whereas in the data, CIP deviations are of different magnitudes depending on the specific currency pairs we pick. Uh, the model is completely silent on that front. Okay, so, uh, and if we focus on the largest CIP deviation, fortunately that doesn't change sign. So going back to the SDF, remember we had the absolute value, so it's not a big problem for us. Okay, so that's the first implication from model. The second implication is um, even though most of the talk today is going to be on CIP deviation, but the model doesn't really require that. It basically suggests that if balance sheet constraints are indeed a problem for the intermediaries, uh, there should be many other arbitrages and you can pick your favorite and uh, you should get similar asset pricing implications. Um, so what's the um, implication of that statement? We think CIP deviation should be correlated with many other arbitrages or near arbitrages. So I'll show you some evidence for that. Um, and the third thing is um, the model, model is partial equilibrium. We're not going to be specific about what's driving the variation in the CIP deviation. It could be supply, it could be demand, it could be changes to regulation. So we're not gonna be able to identify that. So just don't keep your hope too high. That's not gonna be addressed. And finally, um, remember we had the two factor, the RW and the X, um, it's perfectly fine if they are correlated and they are likely to be correlated if you write down a general equilibrium model and in the data, they're indeed correlated. And um, this next bullet I already previewed a couple of times. Um, so concretely, we're gonna construct a test by designing a trading strategy that bets on the size of this future spot CIP deviation today, okay? So, and we call this strategy the forward CIP trading strategy. Note, even though it involves trading cover interest parity violation, the spot CIP basis is an arbitrage. This forward CIP trading strategy is not a textbook risk-free arbitrage. Instead, it is a risky bet on the size of future arbitrage opportunities, right? I think it's an important concept and it's somewhat subtle. So let me just try again in case we are not 
super clear. So think about today, we can do a one month arbitrage. So that profit is guaranteed for a month, right? But we don't know exactly what that one month arbitrage opportunity will be for next month from today's perspective. But we can bet on that. But that bet is, net, is risky because maybe exposed when we get to the next month, the one month arbitrage opportunity will be higher or lower compared to this ex ante anticipated arbitrage opportunity. Uh, so that's essentially our strategy. And we check whether the strategy on average earns a significant risk premium. Okay, so I am going to pause um, in case there is a quick clarifying question before we move well, to the details. Well, there is yeah. a, there's a couple, pair of questions that are kind of related to what you're just talking about. So I'll, uh -huh. I'll read them out. So yeah. from Bjorn or Rocker, uh, an arbitrage earns risk-free returns by definition. How can it then be a risk premium? Or you, do you just mean it makes money? And it's related, so I'll also read the question from Sang Byung Seo. Uh -huh. uh, how can we even define a pricing kernel or SDF under a situation with arbitrage opportunities? The existence of a pricing kernel is typically based on the no arbitrage assumption in the first place. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for those wonderful questions. Uh, yeah, so going back to the first question, I think just what I said in the last minute before we took the break is very important. Yes, CIP deviation, the spot CIP deviation, which I will get to more specifically in a couple of slides, is a pure arbitrage. There is no risk, say, Today, thinking about one month investment horizon, I know exactly how much money I'll be able to pocket uh, for next month, okay? From time zero to time one. But it's a different matter, like from today's perspective, I don't know how much money I'll be able to pocket between time one and time two, right? Because that depends on the next period arbitrage opportunity, which is unknown from today's perspective. Uh, so our trading strategy is going to be betting the second thing, this arbitrage uh, opportunity between time zero and time two, sorry, time one and time two uh, um, today. Okay. So, and going back to the, to the how can you have a SDF, we were talking about arbitrage. Um, so I guess concretely, if you think about it, um, in this case, we have a textbook version of arbitrage. It looks like the intermediaries are making money. But that's a narrow definition just by looking at a dollar amount. If you think more broadly, thinking about the balance sheet implication of putting such a trade on your balance sheet, um, taking into account this making the balance sheet constraint more binding, uh, so putting into account this cost of balance sheet, uh, there is no more arbitrage, right? In some way, these profits reflect the shadow cost of balance sheet constraints. So that's how I think about it. Um, so I can, you can uh, fully specify a pricing kernel uh, just using that insight, okay? So I am going to move on. Um, and um, I'm sorry if you don't know what cover interest rate parity is. Uh, this is the slide to um, get back to this discussion. Um, so let's start with the canonical cover interest rate parity by defining a spot CIP deviation. So remember the second subscript um, denote uh, the spot if it's zero. So um, cover interest rate parity asks us to compare the difference between two dollar interest rates. You can also do non-dollar pairs, but I'm gonna do uh, foreign currency against US dollar for simplicity. So what are the two types of dollar interest rates? You have the direct dollar interest rate. Uh, so say a tau mounts US dollar cash interest rate, say OIS or LIBOR, you pick your favorite. You compare that with some synthetic dollar interest rate by taking a foreign currency interest rate of the same maturity and then paying this FX forward premium uh, between the foreign currency and US dollar to swap that foreign currency interest rate into US dollar interest rate. So if you collect these two terms, um, that's what I call the synthetic dollar interest rate uh, swapped from foreign currency. So if there is a CIP violation, these $2 interest rates are gonna be different. And under this convention, if this X or cross currency basis is negative, we have the cash dollar interest rate to be lower than the synthetic dollar interest rate. And if this X is positive, we have the cash dollar interest rate to be higher than the synthetic dollar interest rate. Okay, uh, this is the standard definition um, that's also used in Duteper Berdelham. Uh, all data and uh, rates, effects and rate data, just standard, uh, coming from Bloomberg. Uh, the 
benchmark interest rate we use since we focus on the post-crisis period, we use the OIS rate. Um, so the, the canonical risk-free rate that people use post-crisis, uh, you can find robustness results using IBOR or LIBOR um, and forward rate agreements. Okay, so the advantage of using OIS is we have a very granular term structure. And um, we are going to be doing our analysis uh, for uh, three splits of the sample, um, pre-GFC, during GFC, and post-GFC. All right. So this is a picture of the three months OIS-based cross-currency basis. So remember, this is the direct dollar interest rate. So three months dollar OIS minus the synthetic dollar OIS from swapped from foreign currency OIS. So it's updated uh, so that you can see the COVID period, okay? So what this picture is showing is um, based on OIS, the CIP deviation was pretty small before OI GFC. If you were to do this using IBOR, you can even get closer to zero. Um, during the peak of GFC, um, the CIP deviation started showing up. It's pretty dramatic. Didn't fully normalize after the GFC. Um, so we had the European debt crisis. Um, we also had um, this very interesting period. Uh, so from 2014 to 2018, there wasn't much distress in the banking sector, but we still had very elevated coverage disparity violations. And finally, we have the COVID period dollar funding crunch. Okay. And uh, so that's the spot CIP deviation, uh, just to make sure. Uh, see it again, it's always useful. We're comparing, for instance, the cash dollar interest rate going from time zero to time three uh, versus the synthetic dollar interest rate uh, uh, going from time zero to time three. Now it's time to introduce another version of CIP deviation. That's what we call the forward CIP deviation. The idea is we're still at time zero, so we're at T. Okay, at T, because the existence of a forward interest rate and FX forward exchange rate at any maturity you like, uh, we can construct this forward difference between cash interest rate in dollars and the synthetic interest rate in dollars. That is known X and T at time T, right? So what forward CIP is, it's very analogous to a forward interest rate. Um, it basically uh, defines the difference between the forward dollar interest rate and the, the synthetic of forward dollar interest rate by swapping from a foreign currency. So if you like notations, um, now what's different is the second subscript. We used to have the second subscript B0, which denoted the spot CIP deviation. Now we have been any arbitrary H, which is the forward starting time. Um, so this is a profit that you can collect uh, only starting uh, after H months, uh, after the, the beginning of this forward starting period. So one way is to define this using the forward interest rates. Um, you can also do this uh, just from the term structure of spot interest rate, analogous to this um, uh, term structure literature. Okay, as long as there is no arbitrage between uh, the OIS interest rate, the term structure of the OIS interest rates and those uh, forward interest rates. All right, so now we know what forward interest rate is, it's time to see the term structure. So here I'm plotting the term structure of forward CIP deviation. The first dot is spot, everything else is a forward CIP or forward cross currency basis for two currencies. On the left, we have the Australian dollar, and on the right, we have the Japanese yen. There are two important differences between these two currencies. The first, as you can see, the Australian dollars, the bases are largely positive. So by the way, why do we have three lines? The three lines are bucketed uh, based on the size of the spot basis today. So think about this as a low spot basis average, medium spot basis average, and high uh, spot basis average. 
Okay, so for Australian dollars, all the spot basis are largely positive. For Japanese yen, all the spot basis are largely negative. So that's the first difference. Uh, having a positive spot basis again means the cash dollar interest rate is higher than the synthetic dollar interest rate. And for Japanese yen, it's the other way around. Uh, despite that yen is a super low yielding currency, if you swap into dollars, the synthetic interest rate is actually higher than the direct dollar interest rate. The second thing is the interesting term structure fact that we're adding into this picture. What we have found is that for Australian dollar, the term structure of CIP is generally upward sloping, whereas for Japanese yen is downward sloping. If you think more generally, the similarity between these two pictures is that the size of CIP deviation or absolute value, if you like, is generally trending up. So and again, analogous to the interest rate term structure literature, we think the the yield curve is generally upward sloping. Um, so that's the takeaway from this chart. So I think I've done all the uh, preps. Uh, it's time to finally introduce uh, our trading strategy. So we define this forward CIP trading strategy. Um, it's a simple strategy. Um, it has two steps. The first step is to initiate uh, a H months forward tau months forward CIP trade. Okay, what does that mean? It literally means I'm going to say long cash dollar interest rate and short synthetic dollar interest rate. It's not a trade I'm gonna put on my balance sheet right away. Um, I'm gonna decide to put on my balance sheet say after eight months. So, but I have to commit today. So it's a trading strategy with a forward starting time fully committed today. But besides the usual margining, I'm not putting down anything today because the required cash flow will not happen until we hit month's H. Okay, that's the first step. The second step is when that month's H, H hits, when we actually get to T plus H, I unwind. So again, that means there's nothing happening in terms of the actual exchange of cash flow, but it doesn't mean there isn't any profits or losses there's going to be a profit or loss depending on the difference between two bases. And the first thing is, this is my commitment, right? This is the X NT, uh, risk neutral implied CIP deviation each month away from today that is contractible today, right? Because this is a contractual, right? This is a forward CIP deviation essentially for tau maturity with forward starting time H, okay? my profits exposed is going to depend on the exposed realized spot CIP deviation when we get to T plus H and how that compares with this X anti risk neutral expected CIP deviation for the same maturity. So if it turned out to be that exposed, the spot CIP deviation for tau maturity when we get to T plus H is smaller compared to this X anti contractible forward CIP deviation I'm going to make money. Um, whereas if the other uh, scenario happens, if it turned out that balance sheet constraint was tighter than expected, exposed this um, spot basis is very big, um, then I lose money. So this is in a sense that this uh, trading strategy directly bets on the size of future no arbitrage violation. Uh, we have a normalizing factor. This is just to make the profits uh, annualized. So you can think about it as a bond duration. And this is like a formula to translate interest rate change into dollar profits. Okay, and it's a nice strategy because it's fully implementable. It only involves um, interest rate derivatives and FX derivatives. Uh, so even if the arbitrage doesn't have access to the actual OIS, the Fed funds or LIBOR rates, uh, it, they can still trade on these uh, strategy. Okay, so are we clear on what this strategy is? Second stop. Uh, okay, so I will go ahead. Um, so this is what I meant. Uh, we saw this uh, forward a CIP cash flow diagram that's contractable today. I can um, enter into a contract uh, to essentially initiate this trade and uh, uh, XNT expect to collect this difference uh, with certainty. But when we actually get to T plus one, say after months, I decide to unwind. Uh, so reverse all the cash flows. And uh, this is again to show you uh, under this notation that the profits of this forward trading strategy is going to be the difference between this um, 
three months as CIP deviation with this one month forward starting time versus the Expo's realized CIP deviation uh, when we get to that after one month. All right, so time to show you some summary statistics for this trading profits. Um, so first, I'm going to show you results uh, for single currency pairs vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar as a start. Okay, so you see that uh, we look at six major currencies. These are the six most liquidly traded currencies, all vis-a-vis -vis the USD. And we summarize the mean annualized profits and the sharp ratio uh, for the three splits of the sample. What you can see is uh, for four out of the six currencies, post-crisis, we have a significant profits on this trading strategy. That's uh, four to five basis point for Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, and British pound, and about 10 basis points for the Japanese yen. The profits are not significant post-crisis for the euro and for the Swiss franc. Pre-crisis, you can get some significance, but the magnitude is very, very small. Um, during the crisis, none of the profits are significant. In terms of the sharp ratio for these four currencies, um, Aussie dollar, um, Canadian dollar, British pound, and Japanese yen, we get a sharp ratio around one. So that's the single currency result. Um, so you might wonder, is there any systematic pattern across currency? So for people who do FX research, you may not need, even need the next slide. You can probably already spot the pattern. Uh, but for most of us, let me show you the pattern. So what we have here is essentially two camps. We have the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, and British pound. What are these currencies? These are the high interest rate currency or the so-called investing currencies in the carry trade language. So carry trade meaning the unhedged FX trade that going long in high interest rate currencies and short in low interest rate currencies, assuming exposed, which is true, um, the high interest currency do not depreciate nearly as much as implied by their interest rate differential. So we have the high interest rate currencies, generally speaking, have positive profits and have upward sloping uh, term structure, like the Australian dollar picture I showed you. And these are the currencies that are typically quite risky uh, in terms of their value fluctuation. So they tend to crash in bad times when S&P crash. We have another camp. These are the low interest rate currencies. You see the interest rate differential between them and the USD is negative. These currencies are not that cyclical or they can offer hedge. So S&P crash, Japanese yen actually appreciates. These are the currency that they're generally speaking, have downward sloping CIP term structure. And based on our definition of the annualized profits, uh, they would have negative profits, okay? Uh, but don't worry, it's negative profits. If you flip your direction of the trade, you can make those profits positive. So we don't have to constrain ourselves uh, to just looking at USD-based pairs. We can also be more generous looking at all possible bilateral combinations, right? And remember, I talk about one implication of the model is um, the model is not going to be able to tell which basis is bigger or smaller, but it's going to ask the intermediaries to focus on the largest because the model assumes that doing any uh, FX CIP type of trade is going to have the same balance sheet implication. And if so, why don't you always do the largest? And therefore, uh, in this table, we're showing you the same summary stats in terms of mean profits and the sharp ratio for the top, uh, I think I printed top eight in the paper, we have top 10 FX pairs ranked by the size of their spot CIP deviations. Um, so it works in the sense, if you focus on the very, very large pairs in terms of their spot basis, you do get pretty consistent results that uh, there is a sizable risk premium uh, for this uh, forward trading strategy. And in terms of the sharp ratio, this one, the canonical carry trade going long in the Australian dollar, shorting Japanese yen, uh, in this case, hedging the currency risk, um, generates a very impressive sharp ratio around 1.4. Um, so in contrast, to, for instance, the unhedged FX carry trade has an annualized sharp ratio around 0.5. Um, so this is, um, this is a very impressive sharp ratio.
And in finance, we like to sort things into portfolios, right? And we can also do the same thing here. Um, so this slide uh, shows you some results in terms of portfolio returns. Uh, so this first one, that's our favorite, and that's going to be our preferred uh, risk factor going forward. Uh, so that's the classical carry. Uh, but we can also do some other variants. Um, so for instance, we can um, take the three currency carry. Remember, those are the, the, the top camp, the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, and the British pound versus the bottom camp, uh, the, the euro, the Swiss franc, and the Japanese yen. Uh, so if we pair those three things up, so we get three carry pairs, and we look up the profits, um, slightly lower, but very significant, uh, similar sharp ratio. We can also um, keep uh, forming a portfolio for the top five uh, FX pairs with the largest spot bases or the static top 10 bases that I showed you on the previous slides. Uh, we get similar results, um, a profit annualized around 10 basis points or sharp ratio in the neighborhood slightly above one. Um, the only thing that would not work in this exercise is if you follow the FX literature, you know, besides the carry, which is the interest rate sorted factor, there is also an important dollar factor, which is like the average strength of the US dollar. In this context, we average uh, the cross currency basis for all pairs uh, for all their US vis a vis the US dollar. So it's the average dollar factor and it doesn't seem to actually be associated with a significant risk premium in this context. Um, so from the model perspective, it's not a surprise because if you average all the spot cross-currency basis, some are positive, some are negative, you end up with an average that is not very large uh, compared to the largest one, which is what you should be focusing on. Um, so I don't think it's a problem for us, but it's an interesting fact to know that in this context, it doesn't seem to be that the dollar factor is particularly priced. Uh, whereas the carry factor shows up very prominently, not just in this classical carry pair, the Aussie and Yen, but also shows up more generally uh, because there is also a natural connection between the size of the spot basis and the interest rate to begin with. Okay, I'll take a pause in case there are questions from the audience. All right, so far so good. Um, so, yeah. so there was a question about how this relates to the rest of the literature, but I kind of think it makes sense to address that at the end of your talk. Right. So okay. the specific question is, in the last month, we've seen Francis Longstaff and Mike Chernoff talking about, you know, intermediary asset pricing. So there was mm -hmm. a question about how your work relates to theirs. But Mike, my, my, yeah. I kind of think it makes sense for you to address it at the end. Sure. Yeah, I think we'll have some slides and materials on that and we can have more discussion if those are not sufficient. Okay. So I'll move on. Um, so one thing that is very interesting and also maybe for this audience is uh, you might wonder, so where does this um, risk premium come from, right? In the term structure literature, we know that on average, long-term bonds have a positive risk premium or positive returns is because the term structure, while being generally upward sloping, doesn't actually materialize exposed, right? So Campbell and Schiller, going back to 91, uh, did the forecastability exercise uh, showing that the low predicts the magnitude of the returns in the term structure literature for US Treasury bonds. We can do the same thing for CIP. Uh, what we have is we have the forward CIP trading profits on the left hand side, and we're going to show that the slope of the current CIP term structure is a good predictor uh, for this CIP uh, forward trading strategy return. Again, intuitively, why do we have a positive returns for Australian dollar on average vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar? Because I showed you the term structure is generally upward sloping, but when you actually get to the future, the future uh, spot CIP deviation isn't as large compared to this ex ante implied risk neutral expectation. And therefore, the difference between the two on average uh, turned out to be a positive number, 
Okay, so um, we can show that in the time series regression, uh, there is one additional empirical challenge is if we look at um, this term enters uh, this forward CIP enters into both sides, right? So if there is some measurement error associated with this forward CIP, it's going to be biased as a, uh, in favoring of finding the result that we want to demonstrate. Um, so to address that, uh, we try to instrument this guy, uh, this slope with, with its lag um, to at least get around with this measurement error issue. So the result is what you expect. Um, the spread or the slope of the current term structure is a very strong predictor of this uh, forward CIP returns. Um, the first few columns are with all the lag or the instruments. The last few columns are with the lag instruments. Um, lag like this instruments and uh, the, the the magnitude of the coefficient isn't changing that much so i think we're we have good confidence that uh, there is indeed return predictability and what is the predictor that's the, the current slope is a good predictor of the actual realized return for this forward cip trading strategy all right so um, you might wonder and also related to the question that was just raised uh, why cip how does it related to the broader literature on no arbitrage violation and intermediate constraint. Um, I said in the introductory slide in our model, there is nothing special about CIP per se. Any arbitrage can be used to measure the shadow price on regulatory constraints as long as they have the same balance sheet implication. Okay, so and therefore consequently our arbitrages should co-move. Um, in the data, there is a good reason to select CIP because it's particularly clean in the sense pre-crisis, it, pre, it was pretty close to zero. A lot of the bases, for instance, the credit spread based bases, um, the bond CDS, the CDS CDX, um, even long staffs, uh, uh, the treasury cash feature bases, they were not zero before crisis, right? So there were some constraints to begin with and some friction, some differences in the two uh, similar things that they were comparing, uh, but the crisis exacerbates those. Uh, whereas if we were to focus on the CIP, we're going to pick up the stuff that's truly new post-crisis because pre-crisis, this object is pretty close to zero. And it doesn't involve a lot of other nuisances that maybe Francis discussed um, in a couple of weeks ago, for instance, the cheapest to delivery option, etc., uh, for the treasury uh, futures contracts. And um, even more importantly, for our uh, purpose and application, it enjoys a very rich and granular term structure, um, pretty liquid uh, at various points, so that we can construct this forward trading strategy. It is not possible to do it for other types of arbitrage we tried. It's very noisy, um, doing a mortgage draw, doing on a treasury cash future. Um, once you go to the future, right, you have these, you're constrained by these uh, four IMM days a year, uh, whereas for forwards, like in the FX world, we have very granular uh, maturity that we can work with. Okay, so that's the reason we choose to use CIP, but I am going to show you evidence that uh, there is a strong co-movement between CIP and other near arbitrages. Uh, so in this case, we have a kitchen sink of other near arbitrages. These are not pure arbitrage, and also these are more longer dated arbitrage. They will compare a five-year difference uh, between five-year uh, bond yield and five-year CDS uh, CDS yield, so this bond CDS spread um, it's not a pure like a three months arbitrage trade. It, the profits is maybe guaranteed for five years, but there's going to be mark to market profit losses if you just engage in four of three months. Um, but it is a near arbitrage, and people do look at those thinking about the constraint, uh, the bindingness of the constraint for the intermediaries. So I have a long list of these things, uh, CDS, CDX, LIBOR tenor basis, the swap spread between the 30-year treasury and interest rate swap, KFW versus German Bund. So this is a German uh, state, federal-owned um, development bank, uh, fully backed by the German government, AAA rated, um, and um, uh, typically yielding higher than the German Bund. There is a similar object in the US, Rev Corp, um, fully backed by the US Treasury, um, the agency, AAA rated, um, typically yielding higher than the Treasury. So you think about these, these spreads are near arbitrage. And um, Francis' other paper with Hanno Lustig um, 
and Colossal, comparing the difference between TIPS and the nominal treasury with inflation swaps. So we do a first principle component analysis. Uh, what we find is this um, blue line, right? This shows the first PC of this other arbitrages. As you can see, these are generally speaking five-year arbitrages, and I'm plotting a three-month uh, spot uh, Aussie yen uh, classic carry basis that we use in our paper. They are highly correlated. Uh, so if I were to plot a five-year cross-currency basis, you'll be even more correlated. Uh, so even a long dated near arbitrage has about more than more than 50% correlation with our, our short-term three-month arbitrage. So I think this um, this is a comforting uh, finding that uh, their CIP is indeed very correlated uh, with this broad um, intermediary constraint measure from other, uh, other spreads in fixed income markets. Okay. The other thing that I'll have to convince you is there is also something new uh, beyond what you already know in terms of proxies for intermediary constraint. So what are the other proxy that we know? There is this uh, pretty well-known paper now, uh, he, Kelly, Manila, uh, that construct, um, so that's HKM, he, Kelly, her, Kelly, Manila, uh, that construct intermediary capital ratio. Um, you can also think about it as very much related to the equity returns on intermediaries or these large broker dealers, okay? And uh, what we are plotting here is that you see these scaled HKM capital ratio or the cumulative intermediate equity return, or think about the index uh, for bank stock, um, has a negative correlation with our uh, spot CIP deviation. The negative ex uh, correlation is expected because in bad times, our measure indicate intermediaries are constrained and uh, this equity based measure indicate that uh, intermediary wealth is low. So, so that checks, there is, um, there is a common message here from crisis period, but uh, there is additional information in our measure. For instance, if you look at past few years uh, before this COVID pandemic, what we had is that the US stock market was quite exuberant, right? which suggests return on intermediary wealth is pretty high, uh, suggests that intermediaries should not be very constrained based on the measures that we're familiar with, like the HKM capital ratio or just the stock return index for banks. But our measure is suggesting a gradual tightening. Um, so I think this is in part related to the full implementation of the Basel III regulatory requirements. Um, so I think there can be additional information beyond uh, what is captured in the traditional measures of intermediary wealth uh, slash intermediary constraint. There's one way to demonstrate this formally. Um, that's what this slide is about. Um, so imagine our intermediary uh, constraint measure uh, through the lens of this forward CIP return is just redundant. Then uh, their usual um, intermediary wealth measure, for instance, HKM ratio or the intermediary equity return should be able explain our uh, forward CIP return with zero alpha. Right? So that's the idea, but that's clearly not the case. Um, if you just run our return, oh, sorry, if you just run our forward CIP return on a constant, you pretty much get the same alpha as if you were to add these traditional measures of intermediary wells. Um, there are two recent uh, journal of finance paper that teach us how to do this more formally, uh, which we also did in the paper. We can construct formal Bayesian tests to basically argue that the SDF that includes both the intermediary constraint, oh, sorry, the intermediate wells proxies and our forward CIP return would fit data better uh, than just having the intra-traditional intermediate wells constraint alone. So there is something uh, to be learned, uh, to be added to, that's our bottom line for this slide. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about the cross-sectional implications. So, so far, uh, I've been focusing on just describing the properties and characteristics of this uh, special trading strategy that we constructed. And uh, we argue that this forward CIP trading profits directly uh, check that the risk of the space is widening is a price factor. We can actually do better than that, right? We can go a step further because our model says there is a SDF with two factors. And if that's indeed true, uh, we can use it to price all assets, 
right? So, um, so this is the cross-sectional test. It's also built on work uh, by He, Kelly, and Manila, where they also do quite a bit of cross-sectional tests. Um, so essentially, for any assets um, we can think about, uh, their access returns is going to be reflecting their loadings on these two factors, the return on intermediate swells and this basis factor uh, pre-multiplied by the price of risk of these two factors respectively, right? So quantity of risk uh, times the price of risk. What is the price of the risk? Um, we have two traded factors here. In the case of our basis, we have this forward trading strategy, right? Which essentially has a loading equal to minus one because when future basis is wide, the strategy generates negative return linearly, uh, more negative respect to the size of the basis. Um, and uh, how about the return on wealth? Um, you can look at the bank equity return. So in the data, uh, based on the mean return, we essentially uncover the price of risk x ante. So that's our hypothesis. If these factors are indeed consistently priced in the cross section, we should expect lambda to be around uh, minus 4.8. This is an unannualized version. Uh, based on the mean CIP return and a 61 basis point based on monthly bank stock returns, okay? So that's our hypothesis. And uh, the goal of this cross-sectional test is to see if we plug in, um, in the cross-section uh, running a two-step uh, Pharma Macbeth, uh, do we actually uh, uncover this type of price of risk? And um, so in terms of the data implementation, we study a variety of uh, assets. We have the Pharma French 25, the US Treasury slash corporate bonds. We have the FX portfolio from Hano's work um, and uh, sovereign bonds, equity options, CDS, commodity futures. In addition, we also use the non-US dollar, sorry, non-Australian dollar and Japanese yen based uh, forward CIP trading uh, return as a test asset as well. Um, we use GMM standard error to account for estimated betas, um, and uh, we try both proxies of HKM, um, uh, uh, both HKM proxy for intermediate return. I'll show you one version, monthly data. Okay, so just showing one version. Um, so what you have is for um, US. Um, this is a Pharma French 20, actually Pharma French is here. So except for Pharma French, so equity is the only outlier in terms of the implication for the price of risk. If you see for all the other assets, so this is the US Treasury and Corporate Fixed Income Portfolio, Emerging Market Solvent Portfolio, FX Unhedged Return Portfolio, Equity Option CDS, our other CIP uh, forward trading returns as testing assets, commodity futures. For all the others, it does come with a negative price of risk. Equity is the only outlier consistent with work by, uh, by, um, by Tyler Muir and Valentin Kadad that it seems like equity is special in this land, land uh, of intermediary asset pricing. Um, and if we pull all these assets together, uh, we actually get a number that's statistically significant. Sorry, I don't have stars on the slides. It's directly copied from the paper. So the minus 0.7, uh, uh, that it should be a hold of five basis points. And for intermediate equity, if you pull these columns together, you get a number that's not too different from 60 basis points. Um, so if you look at the um, H1, the p-value, whether we can reject the hypothesis that the price of risk uncovered from these cross-section tests are consistent with the mean return on the factors, uh, we largely cannot reject. Um, so this is in the sense that we argue that exposure to this risk factor is also consistently priced in the cross-section of asset returns. Um, okay, I think that's all I have prepared for. Just to recap, um, so this paper that we show through the lens of this constructed trading strategy, that the risk that the CIP violations become bigger is priced. Uh, this is, in our view, a strong supporting evidence uh, for the intermediate asset pricing theory. Uh, we give you one version of such a theory, where the traditional uh, he, uh, Krishnamurti model meets the intertemporal hedging consideration by Campbell 93. 
It doesn't have to be the only model, uh, but I think the takeaway that is pretty universal, I think it's going to be very hard to explain away the existence of these arbitrage, why the arbitrage was surprised, why they co-move with other arbitrages and intermediate wells without a central role for intermediaries. So I think more work is needed in this space. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, there was a long question from Steve Figluski, but then Amy gave a long answer. So okay. rather than rather than read the long question and answer, I'll just let Steve re-ask his question or ask a follow-up question if he if he thinks Amy's yeah. answer was incomplete. Right. So I have not read any of the chats. So I my, understand. My, my output <laughs> is going to be independent of Amy. <laughs> not cheating okay all right but anyway if anyone else has a question at this point you should you should feel free to unmute yourself and ask it orally with the microphone well neil as you've invited me to, to do that i've just done it okay uh, i'm trying to uh, trying to push a little bit i really like this line of research uh, i must say uh taking uh, arbitrage as something that is exists and goes away because there's trading. Mm -hmm. And I push a little bit further to think about, well, can we, we're comparing different markets where the nature of the arbitrage is different. And I've always thought that, that the covered interest parity problems came about because uh, the arbitrageurs were playing against the central banks who want to manage their interest rates, to keep them artificially low, or their currencies to keep them, uh, uh, keep their products competitive and so on. And that if you were to follow that, to kind of look at what factors are going to push the arbitrage profit one direction or another, that what, what should I say, the arbitrage opportunity one way or another, you might see that if you're playing against a really strong central bank, that the effect would be really big. And if you're in a much smaller kind of a, a market such as, well, options, I would expect, uh, or and, and maybe equities where we don't expect uh, interest rates and, and, and FX uh, uh, management to affect prices. You don't expect to see arbitrage opportunities being tied to the same things that covered interest parity is. Anyway, that was my, my long-winded hypothesis. Yeah, I think I, I'm very sympathetic with that view, and I think I agree. I think we may even have some evidence in the in a case like for these interest rate based um, portfolios, actually, uh -huh. do we really see it? I think, yeah, for, for instance, um, for FX, um, actually, this iteration of the standard era, you may not see it that cleanly, but I think that they're not significant as a standalone, but the T stat is higher compared to uh, something, say, um, the CD. Actually, CDS is an outlier. So, yeah, so I, I don't think, yeah, so sorry, this may not be as a clean of evidence. Um, but, but I agree, generally speaking, I think, yeah, you think about CIP, I would, uh, my, 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 my intuition and just gut feeling would be, I think it would work better for the fixed income and FX um, trades uh, compared to the equity and options, which are on a separate, um, on a separate um, part of the bank, at least. Um, so, so I think more work can be done. Um, yeah, this test, because of limited power and just because we have a very short sample, um, so it doesn't uncover that, um, but there might be some other ways to, to sort of establish that point. Okay, any other questions? Can I ask a clarifying question? It's related mm -hmm. to the questions at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Early on in the talk, you called it arbitrage opportunities. But this is yeah. not what you really think, right? It's an apparent arbitrage opportunity, but it's not really an arbitrage opportunity because because there's an omitted opportunity cost of using the balance uh, sheet. Yeah, I think I think yeah. So in a fully generalized version of cost, after taking into account the cost of balance sheet, um, this is not an arbitrage. In a way, these the existence of these arbitrage do not suggest there is some like behavioral story like people are like overlooking free money on the table there is no free money on the table after you take into account the balance sheet implication okay oh just says bjorn rocker has a little fact it says interesting side fact 
the ETF with ticker DBV does mm -hmm. currency carrying trades and has been around since 2006. It has a beta of three, but mm -hmm. earns negative returns. So rather than buying it, you should sell it short. Uh, interestingly, the stock borrow fee right now is about 54% per year. Okay. So it's basically a, a thing about shorting constraint, right? I mean, this land, I mean, as we know, right? I mean, going long and short, like in forward interest rate and FX, I mean, it's not as a big deal in terms of. But, but I, 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 well, maybe I'm misunderstanding Bjorn's question, but I thought the point of the question is that this, this ETF that does currency carry trades has a negative return or appears to have a negative expected return. If, if that's not the point of the question, Bjorn can correct me. Uh, maybe I interpret it wrong. I interpret it. There are some, there are some constraints like a sort of a trading cost consideration that makes it not fully implementable. I guess sort of speaking on that, I think we don't consider a trading cost because that's not central. We're not really advocating this as a hedge fund strategy. Um, instead, we think it's useful. It uncover interesting property of intermediary. Um, but if you really are interested in sort of implementability and uh, just trading costs, I think from a large intermediary perspective, um, these are actually pretty sizable uh, profits. We're talking about 14 basis points annualized profits. Um, so based on the euro dollar and uh, yeah, the, the pairs that we're looking at, um, it should be actually um, considerable. Yeah. Can I follow up on Neil's question? So since this sounds like quasi-arbitrage opportunities, do you have a sense about how large a transaction costs here? I assume that the bid ask spreads are really small, but the margin cost could be, could be larger. Do you have a sense about, like you argue this is balance sheet costs, but uh, have you tried to compare it to more direct transaction costs such as margin costs and so on? And or, so or just the sort of institutional thing, just how much balance sheet is used by these trades? For this particular trade, it's pretty much close to zero, right? Because we're talking about maybe like a one or two percent initial margin plus the mark to market, which is pretty small if we're thinking about like a one month uh, forward starting trade for the three months tenor. Um, so it's pretty, pretty tiny. The actual CIP deviation, so the spot CIP deviation, that's like a one to one balance sheet implication one more dollar of spot CIP trade is going to increase your balance sheet size by $1. So that's a nice feature of this trade. So this trade itself is pretty much balance sheet neutral um, with the caveat of some initial margin, but the underlying object that we are betting on is precisely about the balance sheet constraint. If that's making sense. So Neil, can I ask a question? This is Torben. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're free for all now. That's free for all. That's not free. <laughs> Let me take advantage. So just following up on the covered interest parity violations, because they are no arbitrage violations, of course. Yeah. Um, I understand that the banks are the ones subject to regulation, cannot pursue them, or they have a good reason not to. Mm -hmm. um, what is the reason that some capital-rich institutions don't set themselves up to take advantage so that are not subject to this regulation or is it such that all all institutions be it hedge funds or whatever that tries to take advantage of covered interest parity violations will somehow be subject to the same type of mm -hmm. regulation as the banks so i don't quite understand so why over question. time yeah we don't I have all the institutions trying to to use this riskless arbitrage? Yeah, I get that question a lot. I think it's a, obviously a very active research area that people are looking at constraints facing different types of players in taking yeah. advantage or better facilitate dollar intermediation globally. Uh, just to summarize where my understanding is for levered investor, this is not much of a trade because they have to borrow from banks. Thinking about hedge funds want to do a spot CIP trade, it has to borrow from its uh, brokers, right? Like a repo desk to get funding, and that 
position is going to be booked on the repo desk balance sheet, which is affiliated with the bank holding company and therefore Basel III kicks in again. So banks are not gonna give away free leverage to hedge funds at the same cost anymore. So the cost of leverage has gone up a lot for levered investor, which makes it not attractive for them to do a spot CIPR recharge. So therefore, by elimination, we're left with real money, right? A lot of real money, central banks, uh, reserve managers, uh, or unconstrained fixing income funds, et cetera. Uh, these guys are constrained uh, by their benchmarks. Um, they're not nimble enough in the sense if you think about um, like uh, mutual funds, right? like there's going to be a penalty uh, for having tracking error. Like, yes, they can do some of this trade, but it's going to generate tracking errors. Um, so they may not be that versatile and nimble enough to do it. Um, there is a lot of anecdotes that the FX reserve managers are very, very active in this trade. This is why you see so much research on this from the BAS, right? Because that's one of the important business. Um, central banks are very into this. And the Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of Australia is very transparent in publishing their FX portfolio composition. And you see they're massively long Japanese yen. Why? Because again, on a hedge basis, it's higher yielding compared to the USD. I think the official sector is doing a lot, but just because they're also very risk averse being the official sector, uh, they're not all in. It's the RBA, Reserve Bank Australia, it may be an exception. Um, and the other like fund managers just may not be nimble enough. They worry about the benchmark tracking error. So that's my understanding so far. Well, I still wonder what the benchmark profit would be if I waste a hundred million dollars or one billion dollars as a fund mm -hmm. and said, I'm just going to use this for covered interest parity violation trade. Right. What would my annual return be on average over the last eight years or something? Yeah, like it's that? not is really, it, is it really not worthwhile? Uh, it's not it, because it's so it's a it's a very cash intensive trade, right? So you really need to actually borrow and lend. So if you cannot do any leverage, we're talking about the annualized profits, maybe 20, 30 basis points on normal days. Um, you can trade on quarter ends, so you have pre pre a uh, free cash before the quarter or the year ends. There is enormous amount of profits, like the, the high the year end profit we saw on an annualized basis is actually close to 10% uh, for Euro dollar and for dollar yen. So that's astronomical. So it's more of a puzzle why those people wouldn't just park their free cash um, on those couple of days and get very fancy lunches. Um, but on a sort of ongoing basis, we're talking about 20, 30 basis point with all leverage. Uh, so you really need to lever it up to make it like uh, attractive for your clients. And this is where the cost of leverage would come in. Right. So, so what you're mentioning is that there's this uh, temporal variation in the deviations. And when you yeah. get very close, uh, the deviations are very high. Yeah, you get close to the regulatory reporting day. So that's right. our new type of Verdelhan, right? I mean, you get enormous amount of profits. So, so what you're saying is that the, if you were selectively, if you were selectively dedicating money at that point in time. Yeah, that's a very be, good trade. It does seem realistic, but otherwise not. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not attractive. But for those uh, period ends, uh, it is super attractive. So it, it still remains a puzzle why there isn't not enough right. so, money on those period ends to smooth it out. Yes, um, it is. That, that still strikes me as strange. So my $1 billion fund would, would periodically go in and trade on this, and it would have to find other arbitrages the rest of the way. But as you mentioned, there are other arbitrages that may not in timing be perfectly correlated with this one. So it still seems like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So can I ask oh, yeah. one more question? So, so my memory of Mike Chernoff's paper that he presented here about a month ago was that he and his co-authors find a set of interest rates that is sort of consistent with all the prices that makes the arbitrage opportunities disappear or at least be small. So what's the relation between that way of thinking about the problem and the way you're thinking about it? Okay. So, um, as a caveat, I may not be reading their paper closely enough that I could be misinterpreting their results, but my way of understanding the paper is, for instance, 
I think they look at the quite a few things, right? They look at the swap spread, they look at the treasury convenience yield, so-called, uh, so the cover interest parity deviation between different treasury yields in different markets. They look at LIBOR-based or bank rate or maybe OIS-based CIP deviations. I think it's very plausible that all these things, right, looking on a standalone basis is a near arbitrage, but maybe they're quite consistent with each other. So that's in a sense, there is a no arbitrage framework that we can build for all these near arbitrages. Uh, but I think there is quite a bit of residual that they discussed in the end as well. And that residual is correlated with these intermediary uh, wealth measure that I talked about today and, uh, and with the dollar factor, which I discussed in another paper of mine. That's also a sort of a very important barometer for the risk appetite of uh, global intermediaries. Um, so that's my take. I think so the explain portion, I'm perfectly sympathetic, I think there should be a no arbitrage relationship um, between these near arbitrages um, because again, trading on derivatives, for instance, is not as costly um, from balance sheet perspective. And the, the other omitted residual, um, if that speaks more to the actual part that has balance sheet implication that's correlated with these measures we discussed. So I, su I suspect if we plug in our uh, forward CIP trading return into the res residual, it should show up significantly as well. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Wenchen, for a very interesting presentation and a very interesting discuss discussion that ensued. Uh, thank you very much for everyone that joined in. If you want to have some FaceTime with Wenchen, we'll uh, stop the recording soon. So if you're, if you're shy, then... Uh,